What is going on, everybody? Welcome to this week's episode of the Delicate Plan Podcast. I am your channel host, Primitive, and as always, I'm going to be having my co-host, Dante, with me. How you doing, Dante? Oh, good. How you doing, Prim? Oh, I'm doing great. I mean, it's been really good. We got the new year coming in. We got a lot of stuff announced uh, as far as the Digimon world that we can be talking about. And just overall, things have been really good. Got the uh, streams going up, getting some good support there. The YouTube's been doing really good. And so I've just uh, been really loving some Digimon lately. Good. Same here, man. Uh, I mean, we have so many announcements that came up. I think this podcast is going to be a little bit spicy. Yeah, this is going to be... Uh, this is going to be an interesting one to talk about because what we're going to be starting off with is what a lot of the community has been talking about, and I'm sure uh, people were going to be expecting us to talk about this as well, and that's going to be the ban list that was announced. Now, we don't know anything about what cards are going to be announced. We do know that there was a survey given to the uh, JP players of what cards they'd want to see banned, and we know that it's going to be announced sometime, I think they said mid to late January, and then that will be applied to NA at a later time. So although the ban list will come out before Nationals, um, if any of the cards... Uh, that are hit are in our current metagame. It's not going to actually affect Nationals because it says we are going to get it at a later date. I would imagine since a lot of the cards are probably going to be, you know, uh, BT7 or beyond, or maybe even some BT6 stuff, that we will probably not get to the ban list till we hit BT7. Uh, we might get a preemptive ban list, so the cards that do get hit, maybe that's just the rulings that we have going forward. So if they hit BT7 cards, then maybe day one we go on that ban list and uh, we don't even end up having to play all these broken cards. Yeah, kind of like how they did with, um, I believe it was BT4, when they hit the Agumai and they, um, and they hit the potential. They mm -hmm. hit that before the set even dropped. So I can see them giving our giving us and TCG our ban list maybe late February February going into you know the middle of March, just to kind of coincide with the BT seven actually dropping. Yeah, and I think that'd be okay. I mean, there's been so many cards that are pretty oppressive that uh, having a preemptive ban might be pretty healthy for the NA meta. Obviously, the JP players are have had to suffer with a lot of the stuff that we've talked about now. Uh, or with the cards that are going to be hit now, like, some of the stuff that's going to be hit, I feel like is going to be fairly obvious, you know, uh, I mean, I think that we can start off with the one that is going to be on a lot of people's minds on our audience as NA players, and that's going to be Ice Wall. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, Ice Wall is a super oppressive card, like, extremely oppressive. It gives blue decks the, the ability to actually stall out or, you know, one, two, three, four, how many, many copies you play, just stall them out um, to where you can get your resources, you can build your board up, and then you are able to push for a big turn while your opponent cannot even hit your security, uh, um, really can't really hit your security by losing memory when they're attacking. Yeah, and I mean, uh, one of the even more oppressive things about Ice Wall, because, uh, I mean, I've been getting my own EX1 testing in, even though we don't have the cards yet, just preparing for Nationals, and I think one of the most craziest things is the stacking ability of Ice Wall, so, like, I was playtesting for a Jessmon, for example, and they're gonna go to three with Ty, and, uh, you play two Ice Walls, and if they attack, their turn ends, because, you know, they're gonna gain four memory, uh, obviously, or they're gonna pay four memory, obviously, you can, uh, play, like, Seal, for example, to gain some memory to prevent things like that, but it's one of those things where it's, like, if you're paying four memory to attack... If your opponent has a decent amount of security or a blocker, you probably aren't going to win that game. And especially in our meta uh, blue decks with Gabu Bond, it's just super oppressive because it's like, oh, well, I, I need to make it so... Because the turn where you go into Bond is usually a turn where you promote Gabumon because you're going to be able to gain memory from Matt, draw cards, and then that extra memory that you get can be turned into Lobomons and stuff like that. And so being able to like play an Ice Wall and just be like, yeah, you're not doing anything and I'm making it to the turn that I promote is super crazy. And decks that like build up in Raising, like uh, Jessmon, for example, really don't have a very good way to play around it because they can't just go for a bunch of swings and stuff they have to build up and raising and then you just go okay well it looks like you want to promote this turn so i'm going to play ice wall so that way you can't like pop off and otk me yeah it, it's extremely impressive like it's really stalls out a lot of debts just my you know it's like okay so you're going to have to swing in you're going to have to lose two memory your you know your memory gonna go down to one 
and any card that you really play, you're going to go ahead and, and, you know, end your turn. Yeah. And my biggest thing is, on top of that, they gave it a hammer spark security ability to where when you hit it, you gain two memory. Yeah, and that's so, that's the straw that breaks the camel's back, too. I mean, it's already a good card, but the fact that you give it a security trigger that is one of the strongest security triggers in blue in general is just... It's insane, because now we're essentially swinging into eight hammer sparks in security. Oh, my goodness, yeah. And with the with the pace and the speed of Gabu Bond, and we, we know we talk about Imperial Jumon on this, on this podcast a lot, you're, you're really just giving them one, two, three extra turns over the course, you know, of a two best two out of three, and that can make or break any game whatsoever. Yeah. And it's just one of those things where it's like, I mean, you, you, you play Ice Wall, and so your opponent has to swing to attack, and then even if they do commit to the attack, they can just hit Hammer Spark or Ice Wall in security, and then it's just like, oh, well, you just essentially played four memory to attack, and then going back to like when you stack them up, I mean, I had a game versus uh, Security Control, one of our Security Control players on stream, where I played double Ice Wall, and they ended up swinging to attack, and they hit an I- a Hammer Spark, Insecurity. So even though they were at five memory, they did one attack and ended their turn. Oh, I would have been upset. Yeah. <laughs> I would have been upset. Yeah, I mean, she was not too happy when it happened, but it's just one of those things where it's like, even in the matchup like security control where Ice Wall isn't as strong of a card just because they aren't really going to be going for like turns where they swing three or four Digimon in a turn like a lot of other decks will. It's just one of those things where... Even in a matchup where Ice Wall isn't as effective as other matchups, stacking it up is insane. It doesn't end up being like a very dead card. It's just like, oh, I can just play two Ice Wall here. And so if you want to swing Security Attack plus one with your Seraphimon or whatever, well, good luck because your turn ends and you're going to have to pop your Howling Memory Boost or your uh, Reinforced Memory Boost just to make it so that you can attack and not end your turn. Yeah, and I've been doing some research looking around. A lot of people want this card. Um, to go to one, I think going to one is fine. Mm-hmm. Um, even even if they want the semi limit this and put it to two, I do not see anything wrong with that. But anything more than two is very oppressive. Yeah. Um, being able to stack it, you know, stack two at one turn. Now that's one thing to where, you know, you might be able to get a chance to you know play around. You do a lot of digivolve and you start building wide rather than building up. Mm-hmm. And then the next turn, you're able to then swing in with a massive attack. When you have three or more, they can play two, and then if they have one more in hand, uh, you pretty much in two turns from now, and that's enough to win any game. Yeah, and I mean, even playing versus people like in playtesting and other matchups, I remember I was playing against uh, one of our friends, Joe, um, on webcam, and it was like, we were messing around, and he showed me his hand, and he was like, yeah, he's like, I have six cards in hand, and five of them are Agumon, so it's like, since I'm being choked, I don't really have anything to do, and I was like, oh, well, my hand, I have four ice balls in hand, and then he just conceded, because you can't win from there, because it's like, okay, well, if you don't have a memory tamer on board, and you put your opponent at one, and play ice ball, so you can like go to zero, play ice ball, put your opponent at one, they literally can't do anything, they have to choose to attack or play a card. Yeah, and the whole it's just ice and the cape for it to just be a one cost option. I think if it was a three or possibly even a four, we wouldn't ha- we wouldn't be having this conversation. Uh uh-uh. We would not be having this conversation. It'd be a lot more well. balanced for sure. It would still be one of those cards that's probably pretty good, just because it's like okay, you play this card and like you can effectively get four memory out of it. Like if let's say it costed mm-hmm. three, right, and you play it for three, All well, right. two swings is like the equivalent of the memory. Um. And then even the like security trigger, so it is like good. So it would be it would be more balanced. But the fact that you have it at one is insane because it's much easier to stack them on top of each other, and it's much easier to choke your opponent, especially in bond where uh, a lot of decks aren't playing like one cost of Digivolve champions or very many one cost cards in general, and it's very based around like cards that cost three memory or so. And so being able to just be like, okay, well, you put me, I go to three with Davis. Uh, I'm going to play a Gabumon so I can search or draw. And now you're at one and you have nothing to do. And the next turn, I'm going to promote this Gabumon in the back. I'm going to gain two memory, draw two cards, and go for game. Yeah, and that's not even, you know, counting when your opponent just, okay, I'm just swinging, 
yeah, he's going to go to one or she's going to go to one, but I'm at least I'm going to hit security. And then, oh, well, well, you know, here's an ice wall or, well, here's mm-hmm. a hammer spark. Now they go from you giving a one to three memory. Yeah, and it's it's just the thing about the security trigger, too, is it's so insane. Like I said, you're essentially swinging into eight hammer sparks and security now but it's Mm -hmm. even saying that it's even more ridiculous than it sounds right like i've been testing a lot of ex1 since the nationals announcement um like ridiculous amounts of games and it's just like people will like swing one check and i'm like oh hammer spark and they'll swing another check and it's like oh matt oh i'm okay now i'll swing another check it's like ice wall it's like okay well uh you did three checks but now your turn's in now i have matt it's like it's the security is insane in blue decks right now even more so than it was previously and the fact that blue decks have these like naturally aggressive styles of play and now have these incredibly cheap and incredibly effective defensive plays as to where before we had like kakaitis breath um we had uh absolute blast but now it's like your defensive plays are ice wall howling memory boost very cheap things that make it incredibly hard for your opponent to play yeah and Man, this is crazy. Like, I remember back BT3, BT4 era when Rookie Rush was a thing. A lot of people was even, you know, there was rumors about people wanted um, Hammer Spark to go to one or two. Yeah. It was so powerful. Now, combine four Hammer Sparks with four Ice Walls. Like, there's really the, the, the blue deck with the draw power it has, with the rushing capability that it has, with the hybrids. And with the um, cost-efficient option cards, what are you really going to do? Like this, like Ice Wall is too oppressive as it is, but to combo it with everything else in blue, yeah, like that's a that's a recipe for disaster. Yeah, and it, it's, uh, I mean, it's so rough. Like, and that's just, I mean, it, it's such a meta-defining card to come out to, um, just in general, and the. I think it's kind of rough to think about being a JP player and having to play uh, this long with Ice Wall as to where here in like NAEU um, in the the English speaking card game regions, we will have it for a decent amount of time, but it's not going to be for four or five metas, right? And it's like, which is good because the card is just so insane. Uh, It really invalidates just about a lot of matchups like um i was playing in a true champion tournament earlier today and mm-hmm. i played a rookie rush deck round one and i was like there, there was some times where it did look a little bit scary i was able to stabilize with kendo garurumon and grizzlymon but there was just so many turns where i was like if i had ice wall in hand you literally would have zero shot at winning this game like it would be it would be like 95 percent favored because you are are always going to be at, I'm always going to put you at one memory and you're only going to be able to swing once per turn and once I bring out bond I'm going to bot deck everything and trashing my security doesn't matter because you're not going to be able to do anything and so it's like decks like rookie rush just rookie style decks uh like agu bond um even three musketeers is like hurts really hard by ice wall because you want to be able to swing in with your soundbird mons your mm-hmm. um Impmons, even things like um the uh, deputy mon or things like that even swinging in with your big things you want to do those things but when you don't have the memory gain to do that you just have to like you just have to be at the mercy of ice wall and one of the things about blue that is on the other end is like yeah you have access to this but it's like ice wall doesn't hurt other blue decks as much because they also have an incredible amount of memory gain compared to other colors and so it's like right now Going into BT6 and probably BT7, I mean, blue is just so far ahead of other every other color, in my opinion. Yeah, like, and, you know, shameless plug, but I'm I'm right now halfway through my Future Visions uh, BT7, and I thought that all the blue stuff in BT7, it's mediocre at best, but all the other colors got major boost. So I'm, I'm thinking that they saw this coming when they printed Ice Wall. Mm-hmm. I really think originally Ice Wall was meant to be a rookie rush counter for they try to throw cheap little bodies on board and attack you with it. But if you play Ice Wall every time they attack, they, you know, like a Kagoon, like uh, uh, Takumi, yep. that you're going to lose memory. So it's one of the things where it's, th- it's to stop the people from using these low rookie rush type of, you know, decks that want to play cheap and play aggressive and, you know, circumvent the game mechanics that way but it just became a super oppressive card 
to where now everybody's like, just get rid of this card. There's, there's no upside to this card outside of being, you know, broken. And I'm going to use that term literally. It's just straight broken. It is It is broken. It is, it is pretty much about the definition you can get of a card uh, being broken. If a card invalidates entire matchups uh, for one memory in this type of card game where one memory is basically the smallest commitment you get, uh, I think broken is fair to say. Um, it's definitely just a card where, in general, it's just... I mean, it's just so easy to add into decks, too. Like, if you look at any blue deck, it's just, okay, uh, let me put my four Ice Walls in, and then we'll start we'll start building from there. Right. Like, you know, it's such a... Like you said, it's a uh, meta-warping card to where every deck, every color, now has to take in consideration of this one... In particular card that we know is that people are going to play at four at the maximum and now what do you do to get around that how can you get around that the answer is you cannot like there's no real way unless you're going to literally stack wide and pass your turn that you can really get around this i i mean unless you have a, a so far ahead and a live loop to where you just establish all this memory to where you don't care but even then, you have to be wary of hitting it in security and hitting a hammer spark, reduce your memory even faster. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's pretty insane. The card's just absolutely bonkers in general. And I mean, I'm sure we could go on about how Ice Wall is broken forever, but uh, I think we should move on to the next biggest culprit, which is going to be Mega Digimon Fusion. Ooh, Mega Digimon Fusion. Um, I really think this card is way before its time. I actually am one of the ones that are calling, that is calling for this card to be outright just straight, you know, banned. Mm -hmm. If we have it at any number, I think one is the absolute highest. Now, why do I say I that? I agree. Because in EXO 1, we have a white tamer called Analog Youth or Analog Boy. Um, this card is a generic card that you can put in any day. Just like a um, Takomi. Like, you can... Uh, go ahead and put in every deck. It's a white tamer. It's a two cost. Uh, on play, you get to reveal the top three at a Digimon among them, trash the rest of them, and then all it turns with a level five. Um, when, a, when when your Digimon with level five or higher, and do the evolution, delete it, suspend the tamer. If you do, gain the memory and then hatch. If you it hatch in your brain area, if you have a free um, spot. My thing is, it's one of the things to where this analog boy is so splashable. Um, you know, there's just too many good white tamers for us just to throw into, you know, the, the debts. And then we, and this is, and this is not including everything that comes with it. Cause you st like, just let's look at just BT seven, you know, off the bat. Susano Mon's coming out. Mm -hmm. Like th that car is like beyond crazy. We talk about how, you know, me, you talking about how heavy, how hybrid heavy the format's going to be come BT seven. This card just says OTK, and giving them a zero cost digivolution to just play this for free when it's typically supposed to be a seven. That's one of the things to where it's just going to be massively unstable if we're able to let that just run rampant. Because a lot of people can just you know turbo through their deck with hybrids like oh yeah I'm just going ahead and turbo through, and then now I'm gonna play you know um, MDF. And then I'm going to play Susanomon for free. I'm going to hit in with multiple checks. I'm going to get rid of it. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. it's one of those things to where that's going to be ridiculous if we do not check it right now. Yeah. And, I mean, it's just a card. It's very similar to HPD where mm -hmm. you have to balance all of your future cards around that card. Like, all, like, white level sevens have to be like weaker if mdf is around because if you're just able to just go into it for free especially with all of the white tamers that are already out i mean like analog boy's good takumi's good i mean people are playing manoa in their list like people mm -hmm. uh, purple decks are playing uh, manoa in their list specifically because you can go into mdf and it's a memory tamer so it's like white tamers are already very powerful um 
white level sevens at the moment aren't as powerful, right? We have Zwart, um, right. which is going to be really the main thing that people MDF into. But going into the future, every white level seven would have to be weaker, considering the fact that you could play up to four MDF. And um, having that high of a consistency, especially when we get cards like Susanomon and stuff coming out, it's just, it'll be too powerful. And that's why HPD got hit, because um, if HPD was at four, basically all green level sixes would have to be essentially based around it. Uh, if HPD was at higher than one right now, things like um, green OTK would probably be highly relevant for a long time, just because it's going to be so consistent. You can go from a rookie up to essentially a mega for free just by suspending some stuff, which is very easy when you have things like Mimi to bring out extra Digimon from raising. And then you just go into Chaos Mon or whatever, and you just have all this stuff. So it's like the, the main thing about MDF, and a lot of people have been um, like arguing with the JP players who have been saying that they should be banning MDF because they're like, no, MDF's fine. I play against MDF all the time. It's never that big of a deal. Well, yeah, right now, when your main target is Zwart, which is not that strong of a card, with all things considered, sure, it's a great card, but it's, I mean, it's not anything game-breaking, but once we start going into the future where cards start to get a little bit stronger, we start to get new mechanics, um, all those things, if we leave MDF at 4 and white level 7s or anything like come out that are going to be that broken and you just are able to have 2, 3, 4 MDFs in your deck so that way you can always hit it, it has the security trigger of coming into your hand or whatever, all that stuff is just going to be too powerful. So MDF in general is just a card where you have to ba game balance around it unless you limit it. Right, and my thing is, like, when it comes to MDF, it doesn't even have to be a white level 7. It'd be any level 7. We talk about Beelzebub, uh, Beelzebub Blast Mode, and it doesn't have to even digivolve from your hand. It just has to digivolve from a level 6 to a level 7. Mm -hmm. So this is this is what makes it very, very oppressive that you can combine it something with, like, um, Isa and Tate, I believe who it is, mm -hmm. and you can just blast mode for free by after I play this card. It's the, uh, it's the Iron Iron Mako, I think. Yeah, there you go. Ian I think Liza and Tate, you were thinking about the Pokemon gym leaders. Oh my goodness! Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's two different. That's two separate games. <laughs> but yeah, like you can just you know suspend the tamer and bring out blast mode for free after playing you know MDF, and it's a zero cost, so it has no downside. You said, oh, yeah, sure, you have to, you know, I don't deck it. And it, if you win that turn, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Even if you put, you know, um, even if you go ahead and put something like this will probably make, you know, only my anybody even better. People will just probably play it and drop it on top of it. And it's by anybody just, you know, pop the bottom off and it can't move. And But still, like, it's one of those cards to where, any level seven from this point forward, even Crimson Mode that we've been talking about in EXO2, like anything going forward, it's going to become more and more busted with MDF in the in a format at anything more than one. It, well, I mean, like I said, me personally, I think it needs to go away. If it was a two, three cost for, for this kind of thing to where you could reduce it by six or seven, that's fine. That's very cheap. You can make, you know, level seven is cheaper to bring out, whole entire nine. But, uh-uh. Like, I, I really think that this is going to be a very, very poorly designed card, if not unchecked. Yeah, and it's just, level sevens only get crazier, which is the hard part. We we can already see it looking forward ahead. JP already has it. We're, we're quite a distance away from being able to get it here in NA, but just looking ahead, I mean... EX2 has crazy level 7s, um, and it's just that level 7s are just kind of weak right now is the biggest problem, and so it, it's just, it, it's a card that has to get hit, right? It's just, mm -hmm. you, you say it should be banned, um, I might give it the benefit of the doubt and be HPD, go down to 1, um, at that point it's highly inconsistent right now a lot of decks are only playing 1 because once again our level 7s are not as powerful as they're gonna be. But it's just one of those things where the game has to be balanced around it. And I would honestly prefer things to be powerful, um, how they should be, like, naturally intended, how the game's going to play it. And then just have the uh, Mega Digimon Fusion go away. And then you just have to 
do it the old fashioned way. You got to go to level six. You got to pay to level, go to level seven, you know? Um, but I could see it being at one that is coming from somebody who hasn't really played in enough in the future metas to really feel the oppression of it. Um, I've obviously watched it a lot. Um, I have played a little bit myself, but it's not like BT six, right? Where I play BT six every single day. So it's, it's like, you, you, I don't feel the oppression. So maybe me saying it should be at one is just a little bit naive um maybe it is that powerful but i think it could go down to one like hpd does because it does have similar effects but it's just it, it's it's much more general uh hpd has to be like it's it, green isn't as green's powerful specific. green's just not that good um mdf is much more versatile white tamers become much better um white cards in general are just going to be better going forward we already see a lot of cards that are good white uh jessmon plays the sister mons um that are just naturally going to be out jessmon is another deck that only really gets better and uh i guess speaking of jessmon uh, another card a lot of people have been talking about hitting is save your huckmon so what do, you, what do you think about that oh yeah i was just about to bring that up too i i personally do not think that save your huckmon is a problem. I don't think the Just Mod deck in itself is a problem. Just Mod has problems breaking because you can only put so many cards that goes with the archetype in the deck. You have to splash in the system mods that don't really do too much without having a Hawkmon out mm -hmm. or even, you know, a um, a um, Royal Knight out on the board. Like, it's one of those things to where I think the deck is fair. Um, a lot of people will say, well, you know, it's running rampant in my locals. I get it. Well, you have a lot of just my players, so you might be want to call, you know, call for this deck to be hit. I don't think so. I think this deck does get better when BT7 comes out, when it gets the new just mine, um, makes it a little bit more consistent. But you have to remember, at the end of the day, it's just another Hawkmon that gives you more sister mods. And yes, you get two more system mods to go ahead and play on top of that. But the deck is very linear. If you stop them when they're at level four, when they're at level five, their system mods are just sitting there. Uh, they're not going to attack with the system mods unless they absolutely need to or they absolutely want to push for game. So it's one of those things to where they only use the system mods for utility. So I, I don't see this deck really going anywhere. And I don't think the deck should be hit, in my personal opinion. So, from from my understanding, right, is that in JP, there's a lot of best of one uh, things going around, and mm -hmm. in any game, any like just it's not even any four, just any game where best of one is a thing. Um, I can a attest to rank. this as somebody who played early VGC, where back like pre 2013 um, tournaments were just. Like regionals are straight up best of one, and yeah. things that are very high rolly are rewarded in there, um, just because it's it's things like Jessmon. Like l let's think of Jessmon and Lilith Loop, right? Those are decks mm -hmm. where if you hit your pieces in the order that you need, you will win, right? Because you just have yes. something that is essentially not. Uh, we don't have enough interaction on your opponent's turn for it to be something that your opponent can stop. And so when we look at going forward, we get the new sister mons, we, we get a new Huckmon, which also ups the consistency of it. Um, and so it's one of those decks where J Jessmon objectively is going to get better when those cards come out, just because it is more support. Anytime a deck gets more support, it usually gets better. Um, and so it, it is one of those things, but it's just Jessmon in general is a deck where you have to play so many things uh, to make it work. You need to play the whole Huckmon package. You're usually playing the things like the Greymons, which the Greymons are almost useless if you don't go into Jessmon. Um, you have the Sister Mons, which you need things. You play all the option cards, and everything has to work together. You really need to draw and play your cards in the right order for it to be effective. And the thing about that is um, when, when you're playing best of one, and you hit it and you just win it can be very annoying because as the person on the other end you feel like you have no control uh that you can't do anything and that it's just stuff like that so it, in those type of formats i could see why you want to hit uh savior huck because if we look at jessmon in general 
if you like outside of Jessmon itself, Savior Huck is gotta be the most influential card in the ma like in the deck in general. Uh, being able to unsuspend the other stuff is great. The Huckmons are great. The Sistermons, you know, all that stuff. None of that is too broken. But if, if you think about Jessmon right now, if Jessmon didn't have the ability to unsuspend after it just checked two or three checks um, and with delicate plan and then swing again, if it was only able to swing once, it's much less powerful. Playing against a lot of Jessmon decks, if I see my opponent miss the Savior Huckmon and play something like Vulcramon or the War Growlmon or something like that. Uh, I just know that this Jessmon is much weaker. So I, as an NA player who has played against a bunch of Jessmon, uh, I, I always talk about the meme of like Jessmon is just building bricks and uh, building houses, you know, and it's like mm. stuff like that. But if you take Savior Huck out of Jessmon, I feel like the deck just dies. It, yeah, it's the key component to it, you know, the game wants to reward you for building up and not really building out, you know, see all the cards that killed Rookie Rush, mm -hmm. but like, you taking Saber, uh, you know, Saber Huckmon away is not going to do anything but just terminate the deck off the back. You, you can't say, oh, just put in some other level fives. No, the deck core mechanic is inherently hit. So therefore, the deck is going to get crippled, and it's going to fall out of it's going to fall out of position. Yeah. My thing is, you know, like like you said, it's OCG versus TCG. It's one of those things to where in the OCG they're best one. So high rolling decks like Little Fluke can run rampant. High, high you know, high rolling decks like Just Mine can run rampant. But here in the TCG, we play you know best two out of three. You have more conservative decks like you know. Gobble bond security play control. I mean, security game. control basically security doesn't even exist in one. in Japan because if you play security control in best of one, uh, you hit a bad matchup and it's over. Co correct. Like my thing is like, okay, you're gonna hit somebody that plays a delicate plan. They're gonna blow through your security and then you're done. Where here, you can you know, so the longer the match is, the more RNG plays into it. Because you have to reshuffle, reshuffle, reshuffle. You have to, you know, stack, reshuffle, cut, reshuffle. So one of the things where RNG plays more of a factor the longer the match goes. Um, so, yeah, that's why here in TCG, you see security control everywhere. No, you see everybody's like, yo, security control is best, you know, best two, best three deck over here, period. But in the um, OCG, it really wasn't on the radar, but like, what, one tournament, I believe, that it topped? But that was literally it. Like, and I yeah, think I don't think I don't think this, uh, this deck should not be touched whatsoever. Yeah, I, I think because coming from our meta game, it's it's going to be looking at things a lot different. There are things that are just objectively powerful. Ice Wall, MDF, mm -hmm. objectively powerful cards that should be hit. It doesn't matter what meta game you're playing. It doesn't matter what decks you're playing. It's just objectively true right but then we look at mm -hmm. jessmon where it's uh it's very bricky in the tournaments that we see it is a deck that has won more events than anything else in regional wise and that's again because it has a very high ceiling it's it's if you get the things uh or if you play against somebody who doesn't fully have their flow charts down or uh, maybe isn't fully prepared to play things like jessmon and you give them enough time and stuff like that then it's going to win and it's going to have a very high ceiling and that's something that we see a lot there are um the game is very new in general just the whole card game compared to things like magic and Yu-Gi-Oh or stuff like that these games are very old these meta games have been very progressive the players who play them have been around long enough to where they understand these things but when we're looking at digimon there is going to be a lot of players who maybe aren't there and so decks that have these very high ceilings um, are going to be more successful because of the fact that if you hit it you hit it and you win and so we look at it a little bit different because we we think of it as like this very bricky deck that um, we all play test against a bunch. But when you're playing best of one, I mean, think about if you were playing a best of one tournament and your your opponent hits that curve and that deck and then you just lose and that's your that's your loss. Then I mean, it's gonna feel really bad. And so when that's happening to you very frequently, then your feelings towards the cards are going to be a little bit soured and. I think that's the thing about Japan. Maybe here in NA, there's probably some people who think that the Savior Huckmon ban is justified because of the fact that there's so many running around. Um, in our local metagame, there's not very many, and the players who do play them you aren't really our 
top echelon players. And so um, we don't really have to worry about it. It's more so when we play online, but I'm sure there's other regions where it's just like, okay, well, all, all of our top three players play Jessmon and I, I want this gone. Um, and that's probably very much similar how it is in Japan because they get a bunch of uh, buffs. There's a lot of things where Jessmon has just a generally good matchup into it. People have been talking about Jessmon with the Mother D Reaper stuff because you have uh, Judgment of the Blade, so you can swing over it. You can uh, get these multiple checks and try to win the game very fast. And so I think, I, I, I honestly, if I'm going to be completely honest, I very much believe that Jessmon... Uh, or red in general is going to be hit. I think that it can also come in the form of Tai Kamiya. Um, the deck really relies a lot off of those extra security checks as well, because even if you have the Savior Huck, if you're only swinging one check twice, it's not the biggest thing. Um, so I have seen other people talk about hitting Tai Kamiya along as the Savior Huck, but if we're going to be basing it off the JP meta, I do think that pretty much no matter what, Jessmon's going to get hit at some point to a degree because it's just so common and very oppressive. Um, and Savior Huckmon is just the... It's just the key card. It's it, the ability to unsuspend is just that's what makes the deck. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I still can't. I can't see Ty because Ty, honestly, you know, it helps you. You know, it rewards you for building up, mm -hmm. like how the game mechanic is supposed to be. And you know, every okay. So every this whole entire Saber Hawkman thing, um, is on par with another hit that a lot of people was talking about and that's Eismon. Mm -hmm. And Eismon, you know, a lot of people was like, you know, Eismon probably needs to go to two because, you know, it's become it's gonna be super oppressive. My thing is, if you are not a purple player like myself, and you have to understand this. Purple is good if purple hits the stride. It's very high rolling. Uh -huh. So my thing is, if you yeah, you can go ahead and play, uh, you know, uh, uh, I I scatter mode. You can go ahead and delete it. You know, you can draw two and you can draw three, discard two. Just like a, um, it's like if you did evolve on top of uh, with late Devilmon, mm -hmm. you draw, you basically draw three, discard two, and yeah, you can throw two eyes mons into the um, trash and then bring them back out. My thing is, that is such a niche thing. And you gotta remember that the uh, car pool in purple, when it comes out the trash and stuff that want to come out the trash, is so saturated. You're gonna need stuff like promote. You're gonna need stuff like eyes mine. You're gonna need stuff like eyes mine scatter mode. You're gonna just need all these vastly various of cards to where you cannot fit everything into the deck. Mm -hmm. Now, is eyes mine good? Yes, but eyes mine is a combo piece. It's one of the things to where if you don't have eyes mine scatter mode. And the trash already, or if it's not being deleted, and you you know you pitch you discard it from your hand, it does nothing but sit there. It sits in your hand, or it sits in trash. And it's one of those things to where it doesn't even have rush. So you gotta come up with something like a Nubis Mon in order to give it, you know, in order for it to be able to attack. So it's one of the things where it's complementary to uh, to how purple is. Like even we was talking about last podcast with EXO two. They have the purple has a whole new art type that wants to mill off the top of off the top of the deck like light swarms instead of discarding mm -hmm. from your hands. And this is a Yu-Gi-Oh reference, but just like dangerous one discard from your hand. That's how purple's playing now. Yeah. So you can go two different routes. And all it is is rewarding you going one direction with purple versus the other direction with purple. So I think a lot of people probably need to calm down a little bit. Um, if anything, I think. We should see, let it come out and see how oppressive it is. I mean, purple really doesn't get much when it comes to the uh, when it comes to BT seven. You know, it gets hybrid stuff, it gets the dark cherubimon, but it really doesn't get anything. It doesn't really get much unless you want to talk about Lift Loop is coming back. I said a few podcasts ago that you know there's cards that people are not playing that stop your opponent from gaining memory outside of tamers and people will be starting to splash those in at three or four like the gauzy mine that purple already plays mm -hmm. so i think people will probably just need to calm down a little bit when it comes to the eyes mine i see why because it's very it's a very very powerful combo you know just having one eyes mine every time you discard one eyes mine you know scatter mode in the trash 
every time you discard an ice mine, you put a body on board. But in the grand scheme of things, putting you know all the purple into a vacuum, it's not really that oppressive at all. Maybe I'm seeing some. Maybe I'm not seeing something when it comes to the Jorga structure deck because I have yet to look at it. But as of right now, I think a lot of people are you know taking too much from the JP and not looking at our meta game in particular. Uh, yeah, I kind of agree with that, and I also kind of disagree with it. Um, in the JP meta, it's going to be different, and I'll kind of explain why. So, in my experience, um, I was sponsored for Hearthstone for almost five years. Uh, I played, obviously, a lot of Hearthstone in those times, and some of the most powerful cards of all time were cards that could be played for free because you are playing mm -hmm. um a game where bodies is very important and the reason why i think eismon would be so powerful is because with purple what you're going to be doing is trashing stuff from your hand um yeah. and being able to play things for free is going to be powerful no matter what um because like let's think about let, let's uh, compare it to Cordramon, okay, or Geogramon, right? So yeah. if you play Cordramon or you play Geogramon in security and it comes out, you're going to get it for free, right? The effects uh, don't really matter. It's more so, more so about playing it for free. Um, in my bond decks, if people swing into my security and I get a Cordramon out, I'm very, very far ahead because that's one extra swing. And when you add that up to things like bond, it's, it's very powerful. And so, th but the downside to that is it's, very much not in your control unless you're playing tactical retreat right you can't control really what's going to be in your security if you could uh in other decks really just kind of make it so cordramons and geogramons are in your in your security they would be much more powerful than they are now and much more used and when i see eismon i see that similar effect but much more controlled um Obviously, if it comes out of security or if it uh, gets milled off the top of your deck, then it's obviously not going to be as good. But when you're playing a deck where a large portion of your game plan is drawing cards and trashing cards, you're going to have a lot more control of being able to uh, like get those cards out. And it's one of those things where in purple, we're going to be getting cards in purple that are going to be very much more aggressive than the type of things that we have now. Um, purple already got a lot more aggressive in BT6 with things like Titamon, but uh, yeah. nothing really compared to what we're going to be having in the future. And so I could see being it so it's like, okay, well, uh, I go ahead and draw, you know, I played Lady Devi or I played uh, Scatter Mode or something like that, right? And uh, the, you get those draws. And then you're able to choose what you pitch. And even if just one of them is Eismon and you are trashing something, instead of it going into the trash and going onto the field, is going to be very powerful and a very big momentum shift. Obviously, like you said, you're not going to be able to attack with that turn unless you play something like uh, Anubismon or whatever. Um, if that interaction works, I don't think I've actually looked if it hits trash first or whatever, but um, it. it just being able to play something that's big and then gets an extra buff for what's in your trash, it's going to be very powerful just because I think it's in your control. Now, is it as bad as other people say? Um, I don't know. I, I don't have the experience to really say it's this oppressive. I have seen some stuff. Um, I have, I can get a general understanding of the power level of the card just because I can compare it to other things um, in other card games, but I do think that if you're able to play four of them in your purple deck, you're going to have a much higher consistency of being able to drop one, two, or three of those a game, um, and even if some go into trash, it's not that big of a deal, and with the scatter mode, it's also something where if you uh, play multiple, it's going to be very easy for you to get them into the trash, you're going to be able to trashing a lot from either your hand or the top of your deck, and so I could see um, this being banned when we're considering the JP meta, once again, because of the type of high ceiling that decks have. Um, if you're playing a deck and you are like, okay, well, uh, I have three security, I'm, I'm chilling, but my opponent just played a Digimon uh, and that made it so they could draw cards and then they just trashed two Eismon. Now they're both are on the board and now it's like, now I'm on the back foot because if I can't clear these things off or get things like that, then they may be able to swing in for game. And so that's why I think it's going to be a little bit different compared to NA meta. And NA meta, is it going to be as powerful when you have uh, multiple games to play to win a set? Or you have, like, um, even if we hit this 
ban list, right, and we don't hit Aizmon, the metagame itself is going to be different than what is in Japan. And so it's hard to look at these cards and compare them to what we're going to have in NA, but I still think the ability for you to play Digimon for free while doing what your deck is already doing itself is just going to be powerful but i do agree with you i don't know if it's as powerful as people are saying but it's one of those things where it's just if i could play things for free from my hand while also drawing cards it's probably going to be pretty good yeah and that, that's why i was kind of just looking like well come from a purple player's point of view uh how would this card be good yes this card is very good there's no if and buts about it just thinking like it's kind of like the promote it's kind of like the uh game kakuma promote um it's good especially when it's in trash and you bring it out it has rush but in order for it to make it you know it um for its highest you know ceiling potential it needs other pieces that also go up in there as well mm -hmm. so you need a eyes you need know, um eyes my scatter mode to be put into the trash already and then you need the eye uh, on the eyes to hit the trash and then it's able to bring itself back out. My thing is, that's a combo piece that you need on top of that. And we know about anything about purple. Purple is RNG based. So you want to keep on drawing to keep on pitching, but what you draw is always RNG. Mm -hmm. You can keep on digging and digging and digging, but if that one or two Eismon scatter mode is to the last seven cards of your deck, the Eismon are not coming out of the trash whatsoever. Yeah, unless you did evolve on top of it, unless you play something like Un um, Underworld's Calling or anything like that. So yeah. it's one of the things to where it's it, I, it's a great engine if the engine hits. It's very high rolly like purple is supposed to be. Yeah. Um, and I mean, that's just that's just kind of how purple is. Um it's it's always been when you're when you're drawing and trashing, it is doing that. But like I said, I think I think the only reason why it could be up there in power level is because it is a bit more in your control opposed to um just because you get to choose things you get to discard right and so mm -hmm. I, I think it's there it's one of those things where um i, I don't have oh, enough no, experience with it myself to really give a a proper assessment of how i think the deck is it or the card itself is um i just know that it is something where if i if i was thinking about my opponent playing something for free it could be a, a little bit oppressive but it's really going to be metagame dependent if that's something that's not going to be that powerful then obviously it's not going to be something that's that big of a deal but um the people who are playing with it obviously are not the biggest fans of it so um that is something to consider i guess but something else that is a big problem. That is objectively, once again, we're talking about Ice Ball MDF cards that are objectively uh, strong. And Eismon and Savior Huck might not go in there, but one that is is going to be the Tommy Tamer. Um, being yeah. able to on play, you're going to be trashing three of your opponent's sources, which itself is going to be very good. Inheritables are good. Um, being able to trash three sources is essentially an egg a rookie and a champion or if they don't have an egg that's all the way up to ultimate on megas and so the inheritables itself are very good um it's a tamer which is good because that activates color cards itself but it also has the inheritable of when attacking uh you put a hybrid on top of it and then it's a tamer with an inheritable of when attacking one of your opponent's digimon with no sources can't attack or block right and so it's like howling memory boost but you get to go for a check while also having an on play effect prior. And so this is one of those cards where we go back to blue being very powerful and being very strong. Tommy, I think is just in the equation because it, it, I mean, like think about it. You have all these other hybrids, even, even taking out the new hybrids that we get, right? Imagine you put the Kendo Garurumon that we have right now on top of there and you bounce a rookie and also make it so your opponent's mega can attack, right? That momentum shift is going to be so very high um, that it is one of those cards that I think is very justifiable to be considered on this ban list. Oh, yeah. This is one of the cards to where it's definitely on everybody's radar. Just, uh, I mean, we I mean we talk about, um, I talked about Estabalow Mine. In my last video and how this card will pair with Hexablau Mine guarantees to strip two Digimon of all Digivolution sources. And it's one of those things to where, you know, if you know anything about Hexablau, you can't attack if you don't have sources. Now being able to, you know, make it to where you now make one other Digimon not be able to attack or block, it's one of those things to where this is a very impressive tamer. 
And I see what they were trying to go with it. You know, they're trying to give um, blue hybrids that want to um, trash Digivolution cards a go-to tamer. But that's that, that's a little overboard, especially, you know, how powerful, you know, blue hybrids are going to be, especially how powerful that, you know, some blue level sixes are. Th this is going to be a card to where a lot of people might be calling for this thing to be hit to two, maybe one. I don't, in my personal opinion, I don't necessarily think it's ban worthy, but I do think this tamer should be hit in some capacity. I mean, it, it definitely has to be hit at some capacity. Blue is already very powerful. I expect this ban list to very much put the ban hammer on uh, a lot of blue stuff, just because, like I said earlier in the podcast, I do think blue is just very far ahead right now. It has not only multiple ways to play, but just general single card strength is very high. And uh, the the other big problem with Tommy is going to be the, uh, uh, how do you say it, Kori Kakumon, I believe? And that is going to be the uh, hybrid where you can um, digivolve on top of a hybrid. And then when digivolving, if you have the Tommy underneath, one of your opponents digivolve with no digivolution cards can attack or block the turn. So you get the on digivolution of the effect, and then you can attack with it because it's a hybrid, and get the second effect, making it so two of your opponents digimon who don't have sources can attack or block. And that's pairing Ooh. with Tommy's on play effect. And so I think... One of the big strength, the, the card itself is already very powerful, but it also just has this other hybrid that just goes along with it to make it a double whammy. And um, so some people have been saying that they should both be hit just from general power. Um, it is going to be a tamer or a, a hybrid that's at 6k dp a lot of the ones we have right now are like 5k um and being able to have that extra 1k dp is gonna be powerful but just outside of that the the general effect of the two cards um together especially are just so powerful that uh i definitely say that tommy or either i mean tommy for sure and potentially the hybrid itself if you hit tommy the hybrid itself might not be as powerful just because Tommy will be less consistent, but Tommy itself, um, being able to put any hybrid on top of that when we are getting BT7 hybrids, we already have hybrids that we have now that are powerful. Those type of things are just, uh, it's going to be very powerful, and I think it's very reasonable to want that card to be restricted. Yeah, I do agree with that. Like, th these two cards are extremely oppressive, and it's seem with that being said, being a blue player yourself right now, Mm-hmm. What do you think about? We know Ice Wall gets to get hit somehow, some way, some capacity. Yep. We both agree one is perfectly fine. I think no more than two could be at maximum. I agree. You think one is perfect, but you know what I'm saying? Like, so two maybe. With that being said, if Ice Wall does go down to one or two, what do you think the chances of them revisiting looking at Hammer Spark would be? Um, I. I don't know. I'm going to, like, Hammer Spark is a good card, uh, no doubt. But I think where a lot of the strength of Hammer Spark comes in is you don't have very many cards that interact with your opponent's turn. And so being able to have the security trigger of gaining two memory is what's very powerful. If Hammer Spark mm -hmm. didn't have that effect or had a maybe different effect, add to hand. then it would, yeah, maybe if it was add to hand or maybe if it was something just weird, like, draw a card or something you know then then it wouldn't be as powerful because playing a card for a zero in your deck that gains you a memory itself is just it's a card that makes sense to have in this type of card game it's the mm -hmm. being able to gain the two memory on your opponent's side of the uh, opponent's turn it's just one of those things where ice wall is objectively a stronger card because ice wall in both of its effects whether it comes out of security or you play it on your turn affect your opponent's turn and any card that affects your opponent's turn, when we have such a small pool of cards that affects your opponent's turn, is going to be powerful. And so, I, I could, the ice wall interaction itself is is powerful. It makes sense why ice wall wants to get hit. But hammer spark, I don't know. I'm I'm definitely not on the train as of right now to where hammer spark should be hit. Hammer spark is one of those cards where it's like, yeah, this this sucks. But we're in a point now where pretty much every single color has a card where your opponent can't gain memory without tamer or tamer effects so even if you hit hammer spark and security it's not going to happen um cards like that are, are going to be extremely staple right now once ice wall comes out because you're going to have to play around 
eight hammer spark effects and security but hammer spark itself i don't think it get hit maybe if they wanted to hit hammer spark down to three but i don't know i i, I really don't think hammer spark is a card even definitely not ban worthy um and i don't know i don't think it's something i'd be hit i think if you hit ice wall if you banned ice wall hammer spark is fine forever probably um until they print more stuff like that but as of right now i i don't see hammer spark um them ever coming back and looking at hammer spark yeah i wanted to get your opinion on that because i don't think hammer spark is that busted up a card Yes, if you draw multiples, you're able to manipulate the memory gauge a little bit more. That is all those, you know, all those things to where that's very, very powerful in this game. But I don't think Hammer Spark is that oppressive of a card. No. Now, we're talking about Ice Wall. Oh man! Yeah. But we're gonna talk about Ice Wall. Ice Wall is a double whammy. Minutes. Right. Exactly. Like, for, it doesn't matter where is that. If it's in your hand, if it's in security, it's gonna affect the outcome of the game 100. percent Mm. While Hammer Spark, yeah, people can say, well, one extra memory will actually, you know, make or break the game. It's all de- it all depends on how you play as well. So it rewards um, players for um, doing their plays in a certain order, in a certain sequence, to optimize the plays. It rewards players for doing that. So it's very skill intensive. Mm-hmm. Um, but another card, and we and you know, I don't play red, but I know you, you know. You mess around with, you know, just my here and there. Mm-hmm. What about the Star Deck Greymon? What do you think about the Star Deck Greymon? Just having that powerful inherit to give anything a plus one security. What do you think about that card in particular? So, the th- the thing about Starter Deck Greymon is it is a good card, right? It it has a very very straightforward and powerful effect um the fact that it says greymon also now is a big deal um being able to say agumon gabumon greymon or gururumon all mean more than they did previously i would say but the thing is is i mean we we've had very many decks in the past that have played starter deck um greymon like let's let's look at shoutmon right let's let's go back to shoutmon for a little bit okay Shot one would play these type of decks because or these type of cards because you would blitz and get multiple checks but it never felt oppressive right um because it was just one of those things uh you usually activate it off of blitz and so your turn would end and you usually aren't going to be going for game and if your opponent doesn't have any security then the card doesn't matter i think where greymon gets powerful is when you look back at Jessmon. Jessmon is able to make advantage of that card more than once per turn. So um, it is a card that's very powerful. I think it's when you look at the Jessmon decks, I think the, the stack is just security or starter deck Greymon into the um, Savior Huckmon. And then you're going to be able to like, if you don't have tie, you're still swinging at minimum two checks, unsuspending and swinging two checks. But the thing is, is if you have a red Digimon that only swings once, for security attack plus one, even if you swing in three, four checks, it's not going to be as crazy if if you're unsuspending with the Jessmon. And so as of with the stuff that we have right now and the decks that are kind of going around, I think that the starter deck Greymon is fine in most decks. I think it's a very good card that you could play in a lot of decks. But the Jessmon is where it really takes advantage of it just because, like I said, you can get the extra checks and then you can unsuspend and get the extra checks again. And so I think... Even if you were to hit starter deck Greymon, um, Jessmon would still be okay just because it does have the um, restand effect. You can get security attack plus one other ways with the tie and stuff like that, which is why I think when people are trying to hit Jessmon, they look at the Savior Huckmon just because it's it, the ability to unsuspend is much stronger. So as much as starter deck Greymon is a good card, I think... What makes it powerful is Jessmon and the Savior Huck more so than just the single power level card because even itself, it's a 4K Digimon, so it's not a good security check because a lot of things are going to live. It's not a card that you want to be having out as a champion by itself. Um, you can go into an ultimate on top of it and swing for two checks, and some people do that. We've been, uh, I have been seeing some people play a... Uh, Greymon type deck with the Ancients where they play the Aldemon and so you can play Greymon, you can go in the Aldemon, you can play the Delicate Plan and go for like two, three checks and stuff like that and those things are great. Um, I think that's kind of what Red's MO is going like now and going forward. It's going to have a lot of cards that give security attack plus one even if we look at the like Red plugin um, from EX2 that's a 
security attack plus one card so that's kind of red's thing um and so it's a good card but i think it's as a single card i don't think it gets hit i think there are other red cards that enable that card and those are the cards that need to be hit more so than the greymon the greymon is a card that i think is universally good that is just it's like that is red that is kind of red's thing Uh right okay now now i will say this as a purple player there's one card i do want to get hit now i was defending myself in my position on ice mine for a reason because i felt like there was another you know not somebody who's you know being antagonistic when it comes to this entire i eyes my eyes my um scatter mode and that is the option card calling from the darkness now for those of you who don't know calling for the darkness is a one cost option card and it has the ability to where uh, you delete one of your digimon then return two purple digimon from your trash to your hand and the only security effect is add this card to your hand i think this right here is probably the reason why a lot of people have been talking about we need to hit Aizmon, we need to hit Aizmon. I really think this is the culprit right here. Being able to delete Aizmon scattered mode to then return any two Digimon back to your hand, like two Aizmon, then Aizmon scattered mode activates, draw three, discard both Aizmon and put both Aizmon on board for one memory. That's one known combos to where I think the Aizmon package is fine, I think the ice mine scatter mode is fine, but I think this is the culprit. I think this probably most likely needs to get hit through one. It is extremely powerful, especially if you play purple. Like just be able to pop anything. Say you pop a, a taper mine, or say you pop a Digimon you don't need that has inherits to on deletion. Like it gives you so much value for so for so little memory that this card right here is probably the one thing that I want hit. When it comes to these three or this engine of ice mine and ice, ice, and ice mine scatter mode, calling from the darkness, I think it's going to be one of those things to where it's great for purple and it's something that made purple more aggressive. But I feel like the engine itself, the Digimon engine itself, is not really the culprit. I feel like this is the card that really abuses it and loops it. And I combine this with a little of mine to where now when you play this, you're gaining a memory. Drawing three cards, discarding two eyes monsters, and then playing the two eyes monsters. Yeah, this is the culprit right here. Yeah, I mean, uh, if I'm going to be completely honest, I haven't really looked at this card in a viewpoint of being a hit on the ban list. Um, so I think it's I, I think it's kind of like the Greymon we were just talking about, where it's it's a card that's enabled by another package um, and. Mm-hmm. So, I, I, I don't know what would be better to hit over the Eismon or this card. Maybe it's both. I still think the Eismon, um, just in general, is a good card um, that could be hit just because Purple likes to discard. But when when you have a card that's going to be bringing back cards from your hand, or from your trash, that is going to be very good just because... Purple's going to be trashing a lot from the top of their deck. And so if you get your uh, Aizmons in there and you're not able to play them for free, being able to bring them back is going to be good. If you pop the scatter mode, you're going to be able to draw a bunch of cards and then you trash those two uh, Aizmon, like you said. And so I, I could see this. I don't really know what's going to be better because if I'm going to be honest, if we take Aizmon out of the equation, I don't see this card being as powerful in most other purple builds, which would make me think that hitting the Aizmon would be better. Um, but it is one of those cards where it does enable that package. And again, like I said, Aizmon is a card where I'm, I'm aware of it. I, I have uh, some general feelings about the card itself, but I just haven't really been into that archetype enough to really know how oppressive it is so this is definitely a card that could get hit um it might be something where you might have to hit both um if you want to slow down this type of package 
but it's when calling to the darkest when i'm thinking about other purple builds i don't see it being as oppressive just because you have a lot of other type of cards that can bring stuff back from the trash into your hand for major purple builds like um we'll take the bt6 impmon for example you'll be able to bring back things like Beelstarmon or lilithmon and get your pieces um and you'll still be able to get things like that so we we do have cards that are similar to this and I, I, I don't know. Like I said, I, I really haven't looked at this card in that type of light. And so I don't really know how I feel about it. I, I do kind of think that it is a card that is enabled by something that's more powerful in the Eismon package. Just kind of like how I said, Greymon's a card that's kind of like plays with red. This card kind of plays how purple plays purple, but it's enabled by the Jessmon type package as to where this might be more so enabled by the Eismons. Um, if you hit this, obviously the Eismon package is going to be much slower, much weaker. Um, when looking at it, this is a card that really just speaks, do exactly what you said, bring them back, get rid of the scatter mode, play these for free. Um, I can see that, but if you were to hit the Eismons as well, is this card still a problem? Now, the only reason why I would say this card over the Eismon is, you know, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring this up because I hear it all the time. Lift Loop is a thing. Now, a lot of people are saying, well, Lift Loop is going to be super oppressive. It's always going to be super. Lift Loop takes time. But for Lift Loop to now have a target besides, um, you know, Jack Raid, Besides, you know, these, uh, you know, high cost purple cards, you know, four, five, six, seven cost purple cards to really get the ball rolling. I uh, just being able to play, you know, get a Jack Raid and get a call from the darkness bag. And then being able to, you know, play a Jack Raid, get extra memory, play this, you know, play the Digimon for your hand, pop this, get these two bad, play that. It's one of the things where you can now, you have a, um, you have something that live can loop it. I don't think Lilith Mon is necessarily the problem. I think this card is going to perpetuate a lot of those loops, and a lot of people are going to start to looking at this kind of stuff, especially with the um, Letmon that came out in BT6. Mm -hmm. Just being able to pop that Digimon, get into uh, you know Digimon back, and be able to pop a level three Digimon while in the process so you can continue the loop because like i was saying a lot of these digimon that stop that block your memory from about the memory game outside of tamers are level threes you now have free reign to pop at a cheap cost to keep on looping so i yeah i i just from a purple standpoint from a purple player standpoint i really think calling from the darkness is probably the problem here a lot of people would say Iceman, Iceman scatter mode, but I would like if I have four calling from the darkness in my hand versus four Iceman or Iceman scatter mode, I'm going to love this calling from the darkness because I can do so much more with it mm -hmm. rather than the Iceman or Iceman scatter mode. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I I, I don't really know the this uh, the purple cards are the kind of uh, gray area for me personally just because. I just I haven't played nearly as much purple up to this point. Um, I probably won't really be playing that much purple going forward either, up until maybe Dynasmon, uh, Mastamon, or the Mastamon dual color, right? Um, and it's it's just one of those things where I, I don't know. Um, I could see it going either way. When going into the loop conversation as well, it does definitely add some more merit to it. Uh, I definitely really wasn't thinking about Lilithmon when I was first talking about this just a few minutes ago, but uh, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think they are potentially both a problem. Um, my main thing with a lot of, of these cards or a lot of these ban predictions that I've seen is a lot of people have been predicting like, oh, these are the two cards that this color is going to hit, or uh, they're going to hit this one from each color. And well, if, if they really want to balance the game, they're probably going to hit more than two cards in multiple colors blue probably needs to have four or five cards hit you know um Great. and so it's like so what if hitting them both is the answer you know yeah and i know a lot of people have also been talking about um was it jet um, jet, jet selfie mon? mon yep yeah like and my thing is the tcg hasn't even got to it yet so we haven't tested out our meta so it's one of the things to where 
Will it be oppressive in our meta like how it is in the OCG? Or is it one of the things to where, and I know we spoke about this, um, you know, off air, that, uh, I mean, why not give it to us and see how it is in our meta and make our ban list according to our meta rather than the the JP meta mm-hmm. because they play best of ones. We play best two out of threes. The top decks, you know, while Gabubon is probably the top dog out of both metas, uh, the, the top three decks vastly varies. They don't have security control. We do. Mm-hmm. Jetsmon is a decent deck. Jetsmon is one of the best decks over there, if not the best deck over there. And just saw Bialzaman, uh, Bialzaman Blasmo just won. And the Renamon deck just won a tournament. So it's one of those things to where their metas is going to be vastly different than ours with some similarities. And I say, yo, just why don't you just let some of the, We know what the press of cards are. Mm-hmm. We know the ice walls and the MDFs and all those things. And maybe touching up on some combos, you know, some combo pieces before BT7, BT8 comes around. Sure. But... I think with a lot of these um, cards, I think we honestly just need to let it flow. And then when three, four months come by, then go ahead and, you know, tweak our ban list to how our meta is shaping up to be. I mean, we, we went through four or five months of Lord Nightmon. If we had a ban list in, in the middle of that format, Lord Nightmon probably be hit to one or two, or they will put Nightmon to one or yeah, two. Yeah, I think they would have hit Nightmon. Nightmon more than Lord Knight, for sure. Right. So it's one of the things to where I think, uh, yeah, hit the problematic cards, but leave uh, some of the stuff alone that you like, okay, let's see how it is. Kind of like how Pokemon has that uh, uh, we're looking at kind of on radar type of thing when it comes to their um, their ban list and um, expand it. It's like, oh, yeah, we're looking at these cards and see how they impact the meta. They don't just ban something immediately. They look at it. And if it's still really oppressive, then they ban it. I think I think Bandai probably should adapt a little bit when it comes to that here, especially if we get two separate metas because of how the um, sets are being distributed to us. So, I mean, well, there's a, there's a couple things that you talked about to touch on. Um, one, so I'll I'll start with I, I'm not the biggest fan of separate ban lists for JP and the OCG. Um, it might be okay. I, I, that was just one thing that as a Yu-Gi-Oh player who played for a long time, I wasn't a big fan of it considering the world championships, right? And just right. international tournaments because that is a very large and a very strong region to essentially be playing almost a different game from us. But they're so far ahead in the in cards that when we get to a world where Japan is going to be a part of it, how does that work? Because they're going to be multiple sets ahead. And so are they going to come back to NA meta? Are they going to be forced to go back for meta games to play with us? Are they going to have to play on our ban list? And so a part of me didn't like, doesn't like having the same card game be different just because we are, the cards are written in a different language type of thing. Um, Mm -hmm. But so that that's just a personal thing. That's not objective. That's just kind of how I feel. Um, so, but it's just one of those things where you think about it, where they're so far ahead, where uh, it, it's one of those things where how are they even going to be able to interact with our own tournaments in general? To where even if they are playing in a different game, it doesn't matter because as of right now, they're playing a different game anyway. They're they're so far ahead of where we are as far as sets um, that it's just like. W- we're essentially looking into the future when we look at Japan, right? Um, right. So I, I don't really know how I feel about that, um, that to be honest. Uh, to go back to Jet Silphimon, to touch on that really quick, since we kind of talked about that, since that's kind of what we uh, started it. Um, I was going to try to bring up Jet Silphy at some point anyway. Um, that card, I feel like, is objectively powerful, regardless of the metagame, because it has one of those things where hybrids are going to be very powerful. Um, in BT7, we get very strong hybrids and you're going to pretty much be playing them no matter what. And so being able to have a card where you essentially digivolve for one and then you recover one without having the restrictions of being 
three or less, like a lot of cards are, it's going to be very powerful. If we look at Magna Angemon, for example, it is a seven drop to recover one, right? Well, with right. Jet Silphimon, let's say you play a Tamer for three, and then you play a Hybrid for two, and then you Digivolve into Jet Silphimon for one, okay? Well, right there, that is six cost, which is one less. You are able to uh, attack essentially the same turn that you're playing it, and you are getting two draws. So it's like, compared to what we have now of the things that it does similarly, it is objectively more powerful. Um, and when we take into the fact that BT7 hybrids are going to be very powerful, I think a card like this, um, getting hit even in our metagame would be okay because I think this is one of those cards where if you restrict it, it won't be super powerful. It's not ban worthy, but it's one of those cards where at four, your opponent's going to essentially being able to recover for free every single turn while also drawing cards and swinging for a security check, which is going to be super strong. Um, yellow is one of those like colors where up until essentially BT6, yellow was like Bandai's baby. Like they, they gave so much to yellow as far as ruling interactions, cards that you get. Um, there's so much. So yellow is one of those cards where going or one of those colors where going forward, you kind of have to be careful with what you give it. Like blue, they're giving, like, let's look at blue. They keep giving blue really good things. So blue is very, very good. So if you keep giving yellow good things, then it's going to be good. Yellow's not as crazy this meta right now, just because other things might be a little bit faster, uh, like blue and the Jessmon. But once you go into the future and give yellow these very powerful cards, like we're going to get in BT7, people are like loving this yellow hybrid deck. Um, I think... It's one of those things where if you, if you need to undertune it or if you need to slow that deck down, this is going to be the card to really look at just because it does everything. It recovers, it draws, it attacks all at once. It can be very momentum swinging, and it's one of those things where it's just um, compared to the cards we have now, a lot of the recovery that we have is restricted and being three or less. That's why playing against security control, if you leave them at four security, they, they like seven cards in their deck get shut down pretty much um or it's, it's stuff like that so when you have unrestricted recovering um especially when it's in the form of a hybrid or it comes on top of a hybrid i think it is pretty powerful so i think just touching on jet selfie there I, I do think it's one of those cards where we we could have it like how you say where um let's let's have a separate ban list for na because we here in na we'd want a lot of other things hit, right? Like uh, Ultimate right. Flare is a card that should probably, we'd want to be hit. Um, Magna Angemon is a card that I was already considering being hit. Magna Angemon is a card that, in my opinion, if we could get it in any ban list, I would hit it. And Jet Selfie is almost a stronger uh, Magna Angemon. And that's a card that I I already want to get hit. So being able to have a better version of it would obviously be something that's want to get hit. Um, so maybe the having the merit of having a separate ban list is there. Um, like I said, personally, I'm not the biggest fan of having split metagames between in the same card game, essentially. Um, but it's, it's one of those things where it might have to happen just because we have so many things like security control um, that weren't things. We had a lot of decks in BT5 that weren't really decks in Japan during their BT5. So it's very obvious that our metagames are shifting between the regions. So it might... I mean, it probably does just merit a separate ban list, um, and maybe that will have to be something that's considered. But I think as far as what we're looking at from a lot of the uh, JP players who want things banned, I think f in general that having that as the base uh, for maybe our ban list would be okay because there's just a lot of things that do need to be hit. Ice Wall, MDF, uh, Jet Selfie probably needs to be hit. All those things, like... That those are just going to be healthy for the game, but there's just, like, for example, like, I, I would love to have Ultimate Flare hit. I think that's a card that mm -hmm. is incredibly powerful. It's something where um, when you're playing against security control, you essentially have to play every single... You have to play the entire game around potentially hitting Ultimate Flare and security, and when we have a very high security control player rate, like playing in tournaments, there's so many security controls. Every round goes to time because there's like four security control matches and stuff like that. So security control should be hit on our ban list, but they pretty much never play security control from what I can tell in Japan. So obviously if we're going to be basing it off their meta, they're not going to hit security control. And as long as people still want to be playing security control, although it does get heavily nerfed in my opinion, uh, come BT6 a little bit, um, it's, it's still it's still going to be oppressive in our region.
Okay, what do you? And I, I really want to, I really want to ask you about the Nationals thing because I know um, you're gonna be going to Nationals. But one last card I want to bring up is Blinding Light. Now I know Blinding Light is gonna be one of them cards to where, when Yellow start to get their support, um, especially in BT Seven with the uh, Bolt Line line coming out and how you need to manipulate your uh, your security. A lot more. You need to be at three. Sometimes you need to be higher. Sometimes you need to be lower. But do you think Blinding Light is going to be one of those cards that people are going to ask to be hit preemptively, or you think it's okay? Because in my opinion, I think it's okay. But I can also see why, because gaining two memory is very, very good, especially in a yellow deck that wants to manipulate its security wants to go down to three, wants to be able to, you know, play cards and get bonuses off of their effects and things like that. So what is your thoughts about Blind and Light? Um, so it, it's, it hits there in the middle. Um, for any viewers, it does get translated to Blinding Ray, but um, it's it's one of those cards where I, personally, I mean, I played a lot of Lord Nymon, right? I was our, mm -hmm. I was our Lord Nymon player, uh, yeah. very dominantly for a while. Yeah, and, you were. but even then I only played two, right. And, um, I played the purple Kari in that list as well, which generated with it. And so blinding Ray is a card where it's, it's very on the line. Um, one, thing about it is it does not have a security trigger which is much different than hammer spark and that does make you go down because if you hit it in security nothing happens um the 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 where it gets tricky because i think i think gaining two memory to get rid of your trash is fine i don't think that's overpowered i think it makes sense um in bt5 it was very good in things like uh rookie rush and lord naimon just because the card pool is a lot smaller, but going forward, I don't know how powerful it's going to be. The thing that I have to consider when thinking about that is it's, is we are getting a lot more cards that affect when a card leaves your security. Um, when you have less security than your opponent, when you're exactly at three. Now, mm -hmm. when it comes to manipulating your track or your security, um, I do think it is very good. There was a lot of times where I would blinding ray specifically to get to three so I could activate my Angelomon. Now we have uh, Bulkmon, we have Pulsemon, we have Bibimon. All those cards can work with it. But when going forward and we have things like the Jet Selfiemon, for example, which is even more um, security can like manipulation and what your number is there, it can get a little bit tricky. I don't think the security manipulation is strong enough to warrant hitting the list um I, I think it could i think it is a card that maybe could be considered in the future i think looking at the next couple metas i i, I don't think blinding ray is that insane um it's objectively going to be a good card because you are gaining two memory for the cost of zero so it is essentially a plus two you do have to get rid of your trash but yellow and uh yellow has a lot of ways to take care of that especially once we start to get yellow purple decks because purple cards um have ways to be able to interact with your things leaving your security like the kari kamiya for example and then we have like new tamers like tk kari where if you have things less than your opponent you get to gain memory and stuff like that so it just comes down to is the cards that we have where having three exactly three or less than three it, are they strong enough to where it's going to warrant a ban to be able to go to blinding ray i i don't think so um Blinding Ray is a card that has been talked about, I mean, in BT5 up to now a lot as a problematic card. Once again, in BT5, like I said, I, I do think it was a restriction of card pool at the time. Things weren't as strong as they're going to be once we get to BT7, BT8, EX2. Uh, things get way more powerful. So is it going to last? I don't know. I think that's one where I can't really give an answer. I don't think it's going to get hit. If it does get hit, I think it's maybe just goes down to three um because it's just if it had a security trigger then then obviously if it, if it did literally anything even if it added to your hand if it did anything in security it would be 
it, it would be like on hammer spark it would be better than hammer spark right um because oh, yellow yeah. can can work with your security leaving but i just don't think that it's one of those cards that's really warrants being hit like that yeah i i think it's fine um the only reason why i brought it up because uh we have uh kazuchi coming up and mm -hmm. bt7 and kazuchi uh whenever you did your if you have two or less security you recover all the way back to three so it's one of those things to where you can just blind it right all the way down to zero and then digivolve him because you have enough memory to do it mm -hmm. and your turn your turn won't be over and then you just recover three off the back yeah and he gets plus one security out. so one of the things to where i don't think it's oppressive i don't think it should be hit i know there's a couple of people that i was talking to that was like no i think that card might go down to two because you know we got more we got better support coming up for it but i i agree with you i think it's fine i, th I, I want to go ahead I'm gonna go ahead. Yep. No, I was, I was just gonna say, like last thing I say is, it's, it's one of those cards. Like even looking at Kazuchi, yeah, you're gonna be able to go down and recover up. I mean, we have Marine Andromon as well that can recover right. up to six and stuff, and and those cards are good. But it's one of those things where Blinding Ray still does have enough of a downside to it, where um, if if you have it in hand and you don't have the the cards that you need to you know recover two uh right there to go back up to three or whatever like that then it's not going to be as good um if the kazuchi does come out and its security attack plus one is oppressive and recovering and stuff like that is is then then maybe i consider it but from what i've seen from what i feel i think blinding ray is fine if they do hit it it's definitely a two or three it's not a one or ban it's it's just not that good right I Hey, well, I think we're on the same page with that one. But I want to go ahead and get your thoughts on you going to Nationals. So, I know Nationals is, what, the middle of November? In February, if I'm not mistaken? Um, it is the first week, the 5th and the 6th for NA. The, okay, so the 5th and the 6th. So, what are your thoughts about Nationals? And what are you taking to Nationals? So, for Nationals, I mean, as far as my thoughts, I mean, I, I have been prepping for this tournament for months now without even knowing the format i've just been putting in insane work in the just current metagames um a lot of studying in future metagames as well up to like bt7 just because i want to perform well um we now have the information for nationals which shows us that only the top two from each region are going to be going to worlds which is a very high thing to ask that means you have to essentially make finals to qualify for worlds and right. it's 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 good and um the reason i say it's good is because this is going to be our first big tournament with a top cut day two bracket and so we're going to cut we're going to do swiss rounds into a top cut in a top 32 which means that for the first time you can lose a round and still be in contention to win the whole tournament which is mm -hmm. i think a very good thing it's good for card games in general because just in any card game, you can brick, you can get a bad hand, you can have a bad game three, and then things are over, right? And so, as far as nationals, um, I'm very excited for it. The cards that were announced as far as prize cards are insane. The prize support in general is going to be amazing. We have the new uh, Tamer Pack 2 coming out, which is going to be sick. We have the Tamer, um, the Tamer Evolution stamped cards so we get the like kytus breath hammer spark gaia force alt arts that have been a bunch of money in the past but now they're going to be having stamps that have the 2021 finalists on it and so all those things are sick everything about nationals is really great i think the biggest downfall for na here is that we got another pushback um to really nobody's surprise but instead of getting the ex1 which we should be getting this week essentially we were going to get it on the 7th i believe um yeah but now we're not getting it till the 21st which means that we have exactly two weeks with the cards until nationals and um that is not a lot of time now i in 2019 was my last big year playing hearthstone sponsored um and during that year Hearthstone just loved to do this thing where they like announced a new meta or new set like a week before the tournament. So you basically had no time to really practice, um, which is even more detrimental in a game like that where you can't really like proxy cards that don't exist because it's an online card game. And so um, I, I've kind of have this, I've, I've kind of been trained to have um, late testing stuff like that, but we, we have 
the the thing is is if you are serious into prepping for nationals there is a lot of things you can do um you can make proxies you could go if you don't have a printer you can go to a library and most libraries have um the ability for you to print for free as long as you have a library card which is also free so you could print out proxies and put those in some sleeves and uh, you could test them out with your friends you can play in online simulators like tts or untapped which will also allow you to give you that so um, as much as the pushback is very unfortunate for NA, and I've seen a lot of people really complaining about the fact that um, now they feel like they aren't going to be able to test. I think the big downfall to it is not being able to test because there's just many ways for you to get that testing in. I think the biggest downfall is going to be there's not going to be major events um, leading up into it. We aren't going to have like any regionals or anything like that in the format, and we're only going to really have two weeks of like maybe grassroots tournaments. And so, um, considering that the NA and I believe Oceana regional are on the fifth and sixth and then eu and the um uh was it you two two of them are on the fifth and the sixth okay. and then two of them are on the 29th and the 30th a week before or the 28th and 30th something like that so for na we have like the metagame is going to be highly dictated on how the prior week's nationals go because that's going to only be the only big tournament because we aren't really going to have the opportunity here in NA to even run big grassroots tournaments for very long. Um, we'll have like obviously a couple weeks. I'm sure people like Gaia Force Gaming or True Champion Stevens who run uh, big tournaments already will be playing EX1 tournaments. So you can practice in that. But as far as large scale nationals or regionals and stuff like that, we aren't going to have it. And so... Um, I think that's the biggest downfall. It will be very interesting going into nationals with this mostly, I, I won't say mostly, um, un, like it won't be figured out completely. There will be people that can look at JP meta. Um, EU already has it. So we can look at what EU is kind of doing, but it's not going to be a solved metagame and that's going to make it so that there aren't going to be completely refined lists and people could potentially come in with some rogue stuff and be able to hit it. And so I think the pushback, is going to be very interesting. Um, as far as the second part to your question, what am I going to be bringing to nationals? That is going to be a much shorter answer. And that is going to be a uh, Gabu bond because it is the best deck. Yeah, I do agree. I think Gabu bond would be the best deck. I think you'll see a lot of security control. I think you'll see a lot of people play just mine. Um, I, I don't know. I think little flute might be up in there just for, you know, tight sake because tight is a card. But I, honestly, I I feel like if somebody really, really wanted to just come in and just make a splash, I mean, Green OTK just might actually do it. You might have a hard um, time against security control, but if you can, you know, high roll and, you know, get those, get those um, checks in super duper early with green and it goes in your favor, you, um, you might see some green list and, you know, top cut top 32 mm -hmm. uh, i think the tcg is very diverse when it comes to meta you know especially after lord night mine kind of fell to the wayside but you even you know even you saw that lord night mine is a good option this you know this time around in the tournament today that you know he just he hit everything you mm -hmm. know because we don't know if ice wall is going to be legal you know, we don't know. Like, we know that it come out two weeks before, but who's to say that we might we're gonna get another pushback or anything like that? You know, hoping it's not. But you know, it's one of the things to where I mean, really, if Gobble Bond is is Gobble Bond's tournament to lose. If Gobble Bond doesn't win nationals, it, we can you know say that specifically the TCG over here in the NA is very rogue heavy, and we love our rogue. Yeah. Um, I mean, one thing you said about security controls, I actually do think security control is not going to be represented as highly as it is right now, only because really? of the uh, emergency program shutdown. Um, the thing about that is I think Jessmon uh, is actually going to probably be the most represented deck. It is highly represented in pretty much every tournament we have right now, and I don't really see that changing. And the thing about emergency program shutdown is... Um, security control's best thing to do against that is Sakuyamon to slow them down so that way they have to promote um, and get rid of the Sakuyamon and then they leave your Jessmon open to be deleted by Ultimate Flare, Wyvern's Breath, uh, Iron Fisted Onslaught, whatever. But the thing is, is now, is you, your opponent plays Sakuyamon, you can promote your Jessmon, 
play emergency program shut down so they can't play options next turn and mm-hmm. then they can't do anything about it so the people who do bring security control i i mean there, there's going to be people who bring security control i know at least two people in our local meta who plan on bringing security control to nationals but right. i don't see security control going as far um i i I wouldn't have said this maybe a week ago, but now that I've been doing testing against it, it's just that emergency program shutdown literally pretty much turns off 80% of that deck for three memory. And so if you can play it the turn before you're about to go for a very big swing is super huge. And the fact that it also has the security trigger of making it so your opponent can't play options that turn and adding to your hand, even if they do something big like, let's say they... They go for security attack plus one. The security control player goes into yours, and they hit that. Well, how do they end their turn? Because normally they end their turn with things like reinforced memory boost, but now you have much more limited options. So I think security control is just getting a hurt a little bit um, going into this. It's still going to be represented, um, but I think the fact that Jessmon is probably going to be the most represented deck and security control already has a bad matchup to it, when you're able to play just one, even two, security program shutdowns and then just essentially having a 90 percent win rate uh versus security control then it's really going to hinder the deck yeah you know honestly probably forgot about that card but i also was talking i also was thinking about delicate plan um mm-hmm. delicate plan for Jessmon is just going to be so good against security control mm-hmm. um do i think security control is going to be oh yeah i think it's gonna be high represent i think a lot of people um have this mindset of okay it's gonna be a lot of gobble bomb. I'll play security control. Yep. I'm gonna have a I'm gonna have a you know a way to actually you know break even or even you know out grind them, beat them. But then they're gonna run against they're gonna run up against the just mom players, and the just mom players high roll them, you know with emergency shutdown or with delicate plant. All their option cards and security are not gonna activate. Any option cards in their turn is not gonna be able to be played. So it shuts down like two thirds of the deck. Mm-hmm. Like so, yeah, I can really see that happening. Um, I mean, m- we might see a Titanmon sighting. Sighting. We might see, um, you know, black or we might see, you know, the black red knights. Mm-hmm. That deck might pop up because it it does play a lot of blockers as well. Uh, j- I mean, anything to slow down the Gobble Bond matchup is what a lot of people are gonna be aiming for. And when they do that, they're gonna put your hold themselves into actually being more susceptible against other role strategies so i wouldn't doubt just because everyone wants to thinks gobble bond is the best deck we also agree we might see a lot more people actually knock themselves out of the top cut because they they prepare too much for gobble bond and not all the other options yeah. that you might possibly be able to see and and the big thing i mean th- I don't think it's publicly announced how many invites we have for NA, but as far as I know, um, or as far as I've been told, I've heard multiple people say a thousand or more players. And when you hit that many players, every deck is going to be represented, right? And so any deck really has the chance to go into it, but even just talking about security control, it's one of those things that's like, I mean, you have so like you have security control, and people want to play security control as the Gabubon mirror, but or the uh, counter. But as somebody who plays Gabubon literally every day and plays against many security control players who play the games yep. very differently, you are not favored versus a very good Gabubon player. Hybrids are way too hard for that deck to play around. The fact that I can just be like, oh, okay, uh, I'm going to go to Bond and I'll get one, maybe two checks. If I get a third check, you just lose the game. But even if I just get one or two checks, then I just go, okay, well, you gave me uh, six memory. So now I'm going to go into three Lobo Mons. I'm going to play Howling. You, your your game plan versus it as a security, like as a Gobble One player, if you're playing security control, your best thing to do is to go face uh, Ornus Mon, uh, Zwart Defeat with Tide Mat, um, Seraphi Mon. Seraphimon being the biggest one, those cards that have security attack plus one, those those are your Gabubon players because you have to 
beat them before they beat you. If you are going into the Nationals with security control and you're playing a slow game, not only are you going to give Gabubond way too much time to make it so they can get all their pieces in hand, but you're also giving Jessmon way too much time. And so the security control players are they're going to be there. Uh, I imagine a pretty good amount of people are going to be playing it, but they are going to be in for a pretty rough time. Yeah, especially if you like you said, if you slow down the, the if you slow down the game, you're going to give you know every deck chance to go ahead and you know push through. Even Lilith Loop is going to loop you for seven, eight, nine attacks in one turn. What is exactly you going to do with that? Because Ultimate Flare, even when you go Ultimate Flare with um, Iron Fist, they have various wide ranges of levels on board. Mm -hmm. So you're only going to be able to take out their sixes and maybe their threes and fours. But then they still have their fives. They still have the fours if they take out the threes. So it's one of the things where they can still rush you and still take you out. Mm -hmm. So like you said, they have to be very aggressive. You have to come in thinking, okay, a yellow package needs an aggressive option. I can't just depend on those Zork defeats to come out of security and uh, so you need, like I said, the Ornance Mines. You need the Seraphi Mines. You know, you just need to just go in with plus one security every single time to make sure you put them on the clock. Because mm -hmm. if you, because I mean, just two swings, you know, two swings of a plus one security against Gobble Bond, if they don't bond that turn, they're probably going to lose if mm -hmm. you're not losing. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so, I've played so many of the matches, and I can tell you that the times I lose to security control are when they start just going for security check plus one very early in the game before I can get my pieces out to go for game. Because the thing is, is as Bond, you can't really Bond early in that matchup because they have that aggression, and also if you just hit an option card, it's over. You really kind of have to rely on um, the like hybrid things going, and so if you're playing set control and you're trying to play it, you need to play fast. You need to have that security control um, package if that's what you want because you're going to have good matchup versus a lot of other decks because a lot of decks just aren't going to be able to make it to the point where they can get through all of that recovery and all those option cards. But Jessmon, Gabu Bond, those decks, you need to you need to be essentially more aggressive than them because if you give them time, like as a Gobble Bond player, I'm chilling. You want to play out something? Cool. I'll, I'll Howling Memory boost that and I will chill and I will play Tamer. I will keep playing, drawing all my cards. I will hard play Cordramons to draw and all this stuff. And if, if, you're, if all you're doing is removing my Digimon, I don't care because what I need are Tamers and Hybrids and you have essentially no way of interacting with that outside of Zort Defeat and the people who may play All Delete, um, which if you're playing All Delete, I don't think it's going to work as well as people think. And if you if you like do it once, they're going to play around it and it's you're going to get your one win and that's about it. And you need to keep in mind that in these big tournaments, people are going to talk. Um, your yeah. list, if you have something crazy and you play against somebody who has even the smallest amount of credibility in the Digimon scene, by round four of a 9-10 round tournament, everybody's going to know what you're doing, right? Easily. And that's the thing. That's that's a big problem in many games. Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh!, all that stuff. Rogue decks or rogue techs that are influential in major matchups are going to be spread around. People are going to be talking about it. Somebody's going to say, oh, I got all deleted by the security control. Oh, who was it? Oh, it's this person? Oh, okay. Well, boom. They just posted that in a person in a Discord with 500 people in it. So now uh, at least 60 of those people probably are qualified for nationals. Those people know. They might tell their friends in a, D a Discord DM or maybe they're housing with other people who are playing in the tournament. And now they know. And... Those type of texts aren't kept secret. I've seen it time and time again um, where these things, not all, sometimes that doesn't matter because like sometimes the tech that you have and that secret tech is just so powerful that even knowing about it isn't a play around it. But with things like all delete, you're going to know. If your plan is for to all delete me, then I'm going to know that if a Zwart comes out, I'm just going to go in. I don't care. You know, you want to you want to all delete? Cool, delete all your stuff, and that's fine because I just used all my tamers as hybrids anyway, and so well, you're gonna all delete like a couple of Gabumon. And, and I I do agree with you. Like, I just coming from you know playing competitive Pokemon, playing competitive Yu-Gi-Oh, playing competitive um oh my god, so many other games. Like I've played so many TCGs, like seven and eight different TCGs. People talk, especially in a competitive scene. I came 
to a Yu-Gi-Oh tournament with Scraps one regional, and I went two one one by round five, and then by round five, half the people knew I was you know playing Scraps. Mm-hmm. So it's one of those things where people will always talk, no matter if you want them to talk or not, because it's interesting and it's something that they haven't seen yet, and they're like, wow. I just got I just got um all deleted like really, so by who that player over there like you know just in casual talking not being malicious but just a casual talk that's really how that's really how it is in the competitive scene. Now I wanted to get because I I want to go ahead and throw one out but what is your dark horse for nationals if we do have ESO one legal? Hmm. See that's a good question. Um, I was asked that on stream as well and if i'm gonna be completely honest and (laughs) um if if you know me if you've watched my channel if you come into my streams or you know me personally um you would probably expect this answer out of me but i i mean it fully and i have to say uh security d brigade and the reason why is because security d brigade can beat gabumon it can beat jessmon and if you have a deck that has at least like a 35 to 40 percent chance to beat the main decks, that is the main underhorse deck. If I look at other decks, Titanmon, sure, uh, that's like an okay deck, but it doesn't really stand any chance versus Bond. Um, right. Jessmon, if they pop off on turn three or four, you really don't have a chance. Black Royal yeah. Knights is very much the same. Black Royal Knights pretty much has zero win condition versus Jessmon, and when that's going to be the most represented deck, you, you can't. Um, I mean, Zulong Hex Blaumon is just not going to do it enough. You're, that, that deck also doesn't really beat Bond, and it doesn't really do well against security control. Um, Jessmon, it could potentially be okay against, just because you can ice wall them and be able to slow them down, and then if you can go into a big Zulong, then maybe, but if you look at all these other underdog tier two tier three decks that people talk about the thing is is if you only have one good matchup in the top three decks and that's it then you're not an underdog deck but the thing about d brigade is it can beat bond i lost to a bond uh or i lost to a d brigade with bond in tournament just not just a couple days ago because it's one of those decks where it's just like oh okay well uh anytime i swing into security i could either hit something that blows me up like um the ultimate flare iron fisted yeah. onslaught or i swing in and you get digimon that come out for free and if i can't get rid of them then now you just went from having one check to uh four checks and now i might lose the game the rare commandermon it replaces itself so it's a digi when you have something that replaces itself it's very bad like when you're playing bond and your opponent swings and their digimon lives in security that's super bad because you don't have a lot of cheap removal like that and so you either have to commit attack over something or or you're just they're going to get another attack and so I, I genuinely think that the security d brigade although it's a niche deck with a kind of niche player base it's one of those decks where the, the ability for the you'd have that early game of commandermon so you can go for a rookie rush style you can naturally fit in things like chumon which are very good versus these decks and you can also have these strong security uh, like security control does while also having a progressive aggressive game plan i think that's going to be doing well and like i said d brigade can beat gabu bond at like at not like a ridiculously low rate right it it can beat jessmon at a semi-decent rate and so it's like when you have that and these are going to be the main two decks that you're going to be worried about then you can do it because the thing about D- security d brigade is if they delicate plan you and they it's like oh dang it you shut off my uh you shut off my ultimate flare that sucks but you just hit a geo Greymon, i popped your huckmon uh you hit a cordramon i'm gonna draw two and there's a zwart on the field so good luck going into next turn because if you don't win this turn it's over and you also have a lot of blockers naturally in the deck in the commandramon uh blocker and the sealstermon and the thing about that is bond um bond of friendship wants to swing early so it's like Things as simple as just going into a Sealdramon can be super annoying. Playing a Commandramon can, uh, blocker can be super annoying, especially when you're playing it for free from your 1k Commandramon that just got a security check in, it died, and now you replaced it. Now you have a blocker. These things are just objectively annoying. Now, is it going to be the most consistent deck uh, versus every matchup? No, but when you... When we're looking at underdog decks and underhorse decks that can do well, we have to be looking at decks that can beat the at least two of the three top main decks. And yeah, I saw that coming. I had to just go ahead and put it out there. I did see that coming. I knew exactly what you was talking about. <laughs> Me personally, 
I think, believe it or not, I think Greymont Tribal. Just for the simple fact that it has so many um, inherent advantages to uh, to just swing in check many securities. Um, you know, we had red hybrids that could just come off of tamers. You know, you can if you want to, you can throw in two bonds. The uh, War Greymon um, that checks um, security to where they can't um, activate option cards. It's one of the things to where, like how I said, I think security control is going to be pretty represented. And if you have things like Ice Wall and things like Hammer Spark and Gobble Bond, you being able to hit through with that War Greymon and not be able to activate any of them in security, even if you do hit it, I think that really, like just this Greymon Tribal, I think is really a good one. With the promo, um, not Lobomon, um, the Goonie. Um, there you go. Um, just be able to come out, you know, on top of a tamer for you to go ahead and, uh, you know, just did evolve into an ancient gray mine for like just a gray mine, aggressive gray mine deck. Like you, you, you don't have to, you know, worry too much. I mean, I know red has a very, very, you know, high, high chance of breaking. That's just how red is. But if you can come up with something not not like or not on the line of Gobble Bond, but just have an aggressive Grey Mind tribal deck that's able to just eat through, you know, five, six, seven security checks within one or two turns. That can win you a lot of games. Cause a lot of people would not be oh you know a lot of people would not be ready for that kind of pure aggressiveness. And with delicate plan being a thing, you don't have to really rely on the war Grey Mind. You mean know, you can even go straight into the ancient gray mine on uh, delicate planet hit for two security chats um that night like, maybe even three depending on your setup like that that kind of thing i really think in my opinion that gray mine tribal might be that day that we might see and might surprise a lot of people yeah and i can agree with that i actually played with one of those at a local recently and even it was against a player who's maybe not the highest echelon of players. And even then they were giving me a run for their money because it's just the thing about bond and just is if you can outpace them, you have a good matchup. And so um, when, when you have the gray mon that gets security tech plus one, you have the Aldemon you can play. Uh, you have, I mean, you have the hybrids and a Goonie mon as well. You you can have it. Um, I was thinking the Agu bond style list as not really an underdog deck necessarily or else i might have mentioned something like that but I, I definitely agree with you the the ability to like swing two checks early is very good i was playing against somebody in the discord just the other day testing and i was playing ex1 and they were like we were playing in pretty much every single game it was like okay i'm gonna turn one i'm gonna digivolve an agumon then go into the graymon and then next turn i'm gonna swing two checks at 7k and now i feel very far behind if i can't get over this with like a kendo gururumon or play howling to get rid of its agumon or sources well then it's it's very scary so if you're looking for underdog decks just things that are aggressive uh things that can go fast things that have uh fast modes like command Dramon has the rookie rush style while also being able to get things out of security so it's aggressive uh graymons have multiple security checks that's aggression mm-hmm but uh, yeah, I, oh no, go ahead. Uh, I, no, I was just saying like yeah, I do agree. It this is gonna be one wild nationals, and I cannot wait to just see all the different deaths that's going to top. Um, I mean, I'm gonna call it right now. I think Gobble Bond's gonna take you know, ten maybe twelve spots of that top thirty-two. I just off the back, but I think it's gonna be pretty diverse. I think we might see about six to seven different deaths mm-hmm. actually top. Not colors, but different decks actually top thirty-two. I think it's gonna be nice. I think it's gonna be a nice tournament. Yeah, I think I, I think with just the amount of uh, players, I think the top cut will be diverse. I think looking at what's gonna be the most popular, it's gonna be uh, in my opinion, it'll go Jessmon, then Gabu Bond, and then probably three Musketeers. Um, the Agu Bond in the EX one also does get the buff. You get new Agumon, you get the um, Skull Greymon, I believe, uh, yeah. the purple, that's also a good card, so it, it's going to be very diverse. Uh, with such a big pool, you're pretty much always going to get diversity, even if it's just a one-of, if like one person tops with a crazy deck. Like, with uh, with a big top cut, we might see, like, you know, a green 
couple greens, a couple purples, you know, but I think it's mainly going to be the top three, four decks. Um, so we'll have to see. But with that being said, we're going to have to start wrapping up here. It has been quite the podcast. I don't think either of us really oh, planned on going this long about the ban list, um, but it is something that is nice to talk about. Get those thoughts on. It's something that there's just so many angles that you can approach it that you just kind of have to go at. So uh, do you have any final thoughts for this? Um, hey, I mean, I look forward to every podcast. That's all I got to say. I mean, I do too. It's always good talking about the game, um, getting the thoughts out, and we have been having good reception from you all. People do enjoy being able to listen to people talk about Digimon while they're at work or whatever, and so I'm glad we are able to uh, provide you all with something that you do enjoy, and we will definitely be keeping this coming to you. There's many things to talk about each week. We are getting more news and more things to talk about, and so um, if you enjoyed, be sure to come back every week. We'll be uploading these on Mondays, and so uh, each monday you can come back and check this and these are longer podcasts but the great thing about podcasts is you can always just take a break and come back at the break point and it's always going to be here for you it's not going to be a one-time thing but uh with that being said i think we're going to sign off here i am primitive i'm dante and we will catch you next week everybody have a great day great new year peace out